Thank you very much, Silvia, for your introduction. Uh, so yes, indeed, I, uh, I did my PhD in at ICGB, so coming here is coming home in a way. Uh, that's a picture from two, two, uh, 2006. That's me about 15 years ago. And then I don't know how many people maybe um, at ICGB still. This is a group of Chandler Pongars, Protein Structure and Bioinformatics. I think that Corrado is, he, is still here, but uh, he's not in the audience. So uh, my um, my main interest is the um, um, the structural biology of DNA replication, and uh, uh, and the use of cryEM to 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 investigate this uh, uh, the mechanisms of the of uh, DNA replication. I, I thought that instead of bombarding you with uh, structures determined by in my lab right away, I thought it would be a good idea to uh, introduce you to um, uh, to the um, to the use of, of uh, structural techniques for uh, structural determination and in particular cryen to give an overview. So biological structures span a uh, large uh, range of sizes, going from small molecules protein and protein complexes, vesicles, viruses, organelles, up to whole cells and tissues. And there are different tools to investigate these biological structures, tools that have different uh, right, uh, ranges in size of, of the object investigated and resolution that can be attained. So in order to achieve atomic resolution details of a, uh, of a biological structure, the we need tools able to resolve the details at the order of chemical bonds, that is between two and three angstroms. Historically, the two uh, main techniques able to provide uh, such resolution have been NMR spectroscopy and X-ray crystallography. And more recently, single particle cryo-EM and now cryo-electrotomography uh, are now uh, the added to the to the tools that can be used to, for the structural de determination at the atomic resolution, and with great advantages. And I will now try to describe these advantages. So, cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, this samples that are used in cryo-electron microscopy can be in in a, a nearly native state. So, it's an advantage compared to. For instance, X-ray crystallography, where the sample has to be crystallized in a, in a lattice structure. The molecular size of the object investigated by cryo-EM can be any, so any, any size. And most importantly, the resolution that can be attained is a near atomic, uh, near atomic range. Also, sample preparation for cryo-EM is, is faster compared to uh, the sister techniques. The explosive uh, impact of cryem uh, is uh, uh, documented in, in this graph, which shows the um, number of uh, release structures deposited in the protein data bank over, over time, um, structures determined by X-ray crystallography, NMR, or cryem. So you can see from, you know, started from 2013, more or less, that's when the um, Electro, uh, direct electron detectors became available for cryem. You see an, a, an exponential increase in the number of structures output by uh, determined by cryem, whereas the number of structures determined by uh, the sister techniques plateaued. The uh, the impact in structural biology of cryem is also uh, certified by the um, um, award of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2017 to the pioneers who developed the technique, Jacques de Boucher, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson. And I have a, a, a nice personal anecdote about this Nobel Prize because one of the uh, awardees, um, Richard Henderson, received a call from, uh, from Stockholm when he was in the audience uh, at, the Leicester, at, at the seminar at the Leicester Institute for Structural and Chemical Biology, where I had moved as a, fa as a, uh, as a faculty. And uh, Richard uh, is the head of the um, um, 
advisory, advisory board of the Leicester Institute for Structural and Chemical Biology, and I think I may consider myself lucky to be able to uh, to get his feedback on my project, and he has always been a, um, a source of inspiration for me. So, CryEM um, became a um, made the headlines uh, after 2013 when the uh, electron uh, direct electron detectors became available, and uh, which provided uh, a resolution that uh, is at near atomic in the near atomic range. So we uh, went from the so-called globology uh, with poorly defined electron maps to very highly detailed maps uh, where. Um, models could be built, in which models could be built. Also, CryEM made headlines during the COVID-19 pandemic where, uh, because it, it's been used to determine the structure of many uh, spike protein uh, mutants. And of course, this is uh, the information provided is invaluable because it helps to define the um, molecular details of the um, process of viral infection and also for the development of vaccines against COVID. One interesting thing is that some of the structures were, um, were produced within three weeks from the sequencing of the gene to the, ter the, the determination of, of, the, of, the, of the 3D structure. So I will now give you a short overview of what CryEM is, so what the uh, CryEM experiment is and what, uh, what we can obtain from the technique. So in order to carry out a um, single particle cryon project, we need to um, uh, express and purify every recombinant protein uh, in vitro, or we can, or we can extract it from, uh, from, from cells, and then we need to purify it to homogeneity, homogeneity to have a monodispersed sample. So in the, in the protein solution, um, you have a the protein is floating around, uh, in, in any orientation. What we do, we, uh, pla we place the um, protein sample onto a so-called cryogrid, which is a metal support with a uh, carbon cover with carbon films with very tiny holes on which the protein solution is deposited. So the uh, protein solution is, is embedded in uh, the protein particles are embedded into the uh, into the holes, and then are flash frozen in liquid ether, okay? This uh, basically creates a, a vitreous ice layer in which the proteins are embedded. And then we place the, uh, the protein, the frozen protein sample, sample into a transmission electron microscope. The sample is uh, subjected to a, uh, a beam of high energy electrons. The, the electrons hit the sample and are diffracted by the sample and then refocused by a, a set of electromagnetic lenses to produce a magnified image of the sample up to ten, tens of thousands of times. So the protein in uh, the protein sample in, in, in the um, in the cryogrid uh, is frozen in uh, random orientations. Okay, so when it's subjected to the electron beam and uh, the image is formed in the detector, what we, what we see is a um, set of 2D projections of the same protein in different orientation, okay? So electrons hit the sample and they produce a 2D projection of the same object in different orientations. And this is the typical cryo-electron micrograph that we, that we have. We, what we do is we pick either manually or uh, uh, computationally, the uh, particles from, 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 the, from, the, from the micrographs, and then we uh, extract them and computationally and we align them. All the particles are aligned. This is a set of particles uh, of, this, of the protein in the same orientation, which have been aligned. As you can see, the contrast of, the pro on the, of these raw images is low. So what we need, we need to average the uh, different particles in order to obtain a higher, a higher contrast, a higher signals to noise ratio. And this is what we do by averaging. And we, what we, what we um, obtain is um, so-called 2D class average 
of the uh, of the protein. It looks like this, and where in which we start seeing uh, molecular details of the structure. So we, we repeat the same procedure for uh, for uh, uh, 2D classes of the protein in different orientations. So we have we uh, end we end up with a set of uh, 2D class averages which should cover most of the orientations of the protein. And then from 2D class averages through uh, a computational method, uh, different computational methods, we can reconstruct a three-dimensional uh, structure of the, uh, of the object, in which if the resolution is, that can be reached is at near atomic uh, range, we can build a molecular model. And this is basically what we do with CryM. So the um, CryM is particularly useful for to investigate pro protein systems that are big and dynamic. Okay. Um, the replisome, which is a molecular machine that replicates DNA, falls into this category. So we. Uh, we thought to apply CryoGAM to investigate some of the uh, some of the molecular machines operating in DNA replication. As you all know, DNA replication is a semi uh, discontinuous process because DNA polymerase polymerases can synthesize DNA only in the five prime to three prime direction. So the leading strand is synthesized continuously, while the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously uh, in short. Uh, fragments called Okazaki fragments that then need to be uh, ligated to produce a continuous strand. The eukaryotic replisome is a very complex molecular factory made of dozens of proteins, uh, including en en enzymes, uh, DNA editing enzymes, and their regulators. Um, the, the legging strand is replicated by a uh, an enzyme called DNA polymerase delta bound to the processivity factor PCNA. The processivity factor PCNA is needed for the polymerase to be tethered on the, uh, on the DNA, enhancing the processivity of the polymerase from a few nucleotides to hundreds of nucleotides per binding event. So, Okazaki fragments need to be matured in order to obtain a uh, continuous strand. So polymerase delta bound to PCNA uh, fills the gap between two Okazaki fragments. Once the uh, polymerase hits the five prime end of the of a pre previously synthesized primer, it replicates through the primer, creating a five prime flap, which is which is then uh, cleaved by another enzyme called uh, FAN1 that also binds PCNA. In the last step of the, uh, of the reaction, the two fragments are then sealed by another enzyme called ligase 1. The way the, these three enzymes, Paul Delta, FEN1 and, and ligase 1, uh, bind to PCNA and, and operate throughout the process uh, can be uh, uh, in two different uh, ways, either sequentially, binding uh, PCNA sequentially and then dissociating, or binding all together uh, to the uh, to the PCNA ring, which is a homotrimer, uh, in the in the so-called two delta model. But what are DNA polymerases? So DNA polymerases are enzymes that replicate uh, primer by the cyclic incorporation of uh, nucleotides that match the template uh, strand sequence. The structure of uh, many catalytic domains of uh, polymerases. Uh, have been determined, including that of uh, East polymerase delta. All these uh, structures show a conserved fold where the uh, so-called thumb, palm and fingers domain of the polymerase grasp the uh, primer template DNA like a right hand. But the question is, how can we determine the structure of all DNA polymerase, polymerase pole enzymes? Because eukaryotic polymerases are made of uh, um, several subunits, which are large and dynamic, okay? This, uh, this uh, polymerases have been um, very difficult targets to study by, by traditional approaches. So 
such as extraterrestrial and NMR because of their their size and or their flexibility. So we uh, apply cryen to uh, determine the structure of the uh, of human polymerase delta polyenzyme bound to pCNA and primer template DNA. In order to carry out this project, we uh, collaborated with uh, the lab of Samir Handan at KAUST, which can produce a, 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 an active uh, uh, recombinant form of human polymerase delta. Then samples uh, are shipped to Leicester, where my student, uh, Claudia Lance, a very talented student at the LISP of Leicester, uh, carried out the CROEM work. So after many trials and, uh, of course, uh, many tests, different, test, different uh, uh, conditions, and so on, we managed to obtain a uh, three angstrom resolution map of the, of the complex, which allowed us to build a model uh, of the whole uh, pole delta, pole enzyme. So polymerase delta is composed of uh, four subunits, the catalytic subunit, the catalytic subunit, and three regulatory subunits. In the cryogenic structure of the complex, the um, catalytic subunit sits on top of the PCNA ring, while the regulatory subunits project laterally, and the DNA, uh, the primer template DNA, exits the um, catalytic um, site of the polymerase and threads through the PCNA ring. Okay, so this gives the, uh, the overall architecture of the whole enzyme, the processive uh, whole delta whole enzyme. The DNA and the and, uh, bound to the active site shows that the uh, incoming nucleotide pairs with the um, complementary base uh, in the template strand, and this uh, tells that the enzyme was caught in the act of DNA synthesis. In the structure, we uh, um, identified an iron sulfur cluster uh, that is buried in a pocket between the catalytic and the regulatory subunits of the polymerase. And we show in the structure that the, uh, this uh, iron sulfur cluster is, is very important for the structural integrity of the, of the, of the whole complex. Previously, it has been shown that um, oxidation of the iron sulfur cluster of pole delta generates a pole delta whole enzyme that, it, that synthesizes DNA very slowly. Okay, so it could be that, based on, the, on our structure, it could be that oxidation of the iron sulfur cluster generates a uh, long-range conformational change that propagates to the PCNA binding site, may modulate the uh, orientation of PCNA and hindering the translocation of the whole enzyme. Of whole of the whole enzyme. We also identified and modeled the, P12, the small P12 subunit of the polymerase and showed that it binds, uh, it basically bridges the catalytic module and the regulatory modules, module of the polymerase. And this may be uh, uh, important to regulate the uh, flexibility of the, uh, the relative flexibility of these modules a property that may be important for the um, exonuclease activity of the polymerase in correcting uh, mismatches. Most importantly, our structure defines the interactions uh, of the polymerase with PCNA. That is uh, what gives processivity and speed of replication to the, the polymerase, how it is tethered to PCNA. So we found three main contact points of the polymerase to the uh, to PCNA. One uh, peak box uh, interaction with uh, for a peak box located in the C terminal domain of the, in the C terminal domain of the catalytic subunit of the polymerase that binds to a, a hydrophobic a hydrophobic pocket on PCNA. Then a small uh, beta sheet between the C terminal domain of the polymerase and the so-called IDCL loop of PCNA, and then an interaction between a, a loop in the thumb domain of the polymerase and the loop uh, on the front face of PCNA. So these are the three main interactions. 
the tether polymerase to the clamp. So then we asked ourselves, uh, how, uh, how can these interactions modulate the activity of the polymerase? So in order to investigate this, um, um, to, to try to answer these questions, we um, applied a, uh, we used a, a single molecule assay that basically um, function, functions like this. A long single-stranded uh, DNA is uh, connected on one hand, on one end to uh, paramagnetic, paramagnetic beads, and on the other to the, uh, to the surface of the cover slip. And the uh, system is uh, placed in a um, microfluidic uh, cell under flow. Then once you, you add a primer, and then polymerase delta and PCNA, the uh, single-stranded DNA is converted to double-stranded DNA, and this lengthening is recorded over time from the position of the, of the bead. And it is uh, so that the uh, activity parameters of the, of the polymerase can be derived. Okay? Rate of, of synthesis, processivity, and lifetime. So we found that all mutations in the polymerase PCNA interface severely reduce the rate of synthesis of the polymerase. Okay, so they have a very important role in regulating the activity of the polymerase. Um, but what is the structural basis for this uh, uh, effect that we see? Again, Traian helped us form a, 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 a propose a hypothesis to explain these results. So our Traian data um, show that the polymerase delta whole enzymes exist in different conformers. Okay low populated conformers where the orientation of the PCNA ring is different from the, let's say, the uh, mostly, most populated conformer. In, the, in this uh, uh, conformers where PCNA is tilted, only the peak box interaction is maintained, whereas the other interactions are lost. Okay, so we found that in the, in the um, band conformers, the DNA within the PCNA uh, ring interacts with the uh, basic residues on the inner uh, rim of the, of the PCNA ring. Okay, so we propose that once the, uh, some of the interactions between the polymerase and PCNA are lost, the tilt of, of the PCNA ring changes, and this generates a, a, an interaction with, uh, with, with, the, with the inner uh, rim of, of the ring that basically creates an electrostatic drag that slows down the polymerase. So we have a mechanism that explains the, uh, um, how PCNA controls the polymerase speed of replication. Once all the interactions between the, uh, the polymerase and PCNA are established, PCNA changes its tilt and breaks the, uh, the interaction between the clamp and, and, and the DNA so that the polymerase can achieve full speed. Our crime structure allowed us to map uh, many uh, cancer-promoting mutations in human polymerase delta. We found that most of the mutations are located either in the polymerase active site or in the exonuclease active site, pointing that this, these mutations may have an effect on, on both the rate of polymerase uh, synthesis and the, uh, the activity of the polymerase to correct for replication mistakes. Then we went on and we, uh, we used CryEM to determine the structure of different complexes operating in uh, Okazaki fragment, fragment maturation. So we obtained a structure of the uh, gap filling complex in Okazaki fragment maturation that uh, includes whole delta, PCNA, and FEN1, that is the enzyme that cleaves the five prime flap during Okazaki fragment maturation, as I showed you in one of the previous slides. So for, based on this structure, you, you can see that FEN1 is positioned, first of all, it binds PCNA uh, 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 together with whole delta, like in a tool belt, and is positioned in a, in, the, in a proper orientation to capture the DNA uh, 
uh, the exit, the polymerase active site after strand displacement. Okay, so that makes perfect sense. Recently, we also obtained a, a cryonic structure of the of FEN1 bound to PCNA and the FLAP DNA that basically represents the uh, flat cleavage step of the Okazaki fragment alteration process. And based on our data, it seems that the polymerase dissociates from PCNA once the uh, DNA is handed off to, to FEN1. Okay, so the interaction uh, of the polymerase with PCNA is not stable in the absence of DNA. Now we are focusing on the last step of the uh, of, of Okazaki fragment maturation, that is uh, the um, seeding of two Okazaki fragments. This process is carried out by an enzyme called ligase 1. Human ligase 1 is composed of three folded domains, a DNA binding domain, an adenylation domain, and the oligonucleotide binding domain. And the enzyme works through a three-step reaction in ligating uh, Okazaki fragments. In the first step, um, ATP is processed to AMP. Then in the second step, the AMP, the AMP uh, molecule is trans transferred to the phosphate, the five prime of the, of the Okazaki fragment to be ligated. Then in the last step of the, of the reaction, Phosphodiester bond is formed between the phosphate at the five prime and the hydroxyl at the three prime end of the, uh, pre of the previous fragment. The structure of human ligase one is known; it's been known since uh, to 2004. It shows that the three domains of the ligase encircle the DNA, the nicked DNA substrate and bring the uh, active site residues of, the, of the, uh, the ligase and metal cofactors in the correct position to carry out the third step of the ligation reaction. What is not known is the structure of the ligase in complex with PCNA, because uh, it is known that Okazaki fragment maturation depends on the interaction between the ligase and PCNA. So I, uh, we used cryoEM to determine the structure of the whole enzyme. Uh, Carrie Blair, my, uh, another PhD student from my lab in Leicester, worked on this project and managed to obtain a um, near atomic resolution structure of ligase bound to a nic DNA substrate and PCNA, showing that the uh, complex forms a two-stack uh, two ring structure with the ligase sitting on top of PCNA and the, and the DNA running across the um, ligase and through PCNA. So the uh, complex was captured in the last step of the ligation reaction because the DNA is um, adenylated. And we found that the uh, ligase is tethered to PCNA through a short uh, beat box motif of only a few amino acids. Small su surface of interaction confers mobility to the to the ligase uh, relative to PCNA, as we can document by cryoEM. So cryoEM also allows you to um, um, probe the dynamics of proteins, not only the structure. So we can see that the the, the ligase can rotate uh, relative to PCNA um, through the uh, flexible tethering. Um, to the PCNA ring. So we formed, we, we formed the hypothesis that the interaction between the ligase and PCNA is uh, required to, for the ligase to capture the DNA substrate from, from FEN1 after flap cleavage. Okay? So in order to uh, probe this uh, hypothesis, we uh, generated a ligase 1 mutant where the interaction, uh, the residues interacting with PCNA were mutated, and we measured the ligase activity of, of this, uh, of this uh, ligase mutant in ligating a DNA substrate, a mixed DNA substrate that was preassembled with PCNA and FEN1. And what we found is that the ligase mutant seals the NIC. <coughs> Sorry. four times lower than wild-type ligase-1 
And this is consistent with, the, uh, with uh, our hypothesis that the interaction with, PC, with PCNA is required for the ligase to, to shuffle the DNA from FN1 into uh, the ligase active site. And this is also in agreement with the crime structure that we determined of the <coughs> complex of uh, ligase 1, PCNA, and FN1, and leak DNA in one single complex. In this uh, uh, crime structure, we, 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 we see that the NIC DNA is sequestered by the ligase that encircles the, the DNA substrate through its three domains so that the DNA cannot be reverted back to FN1. So, um, through CryoM, we managed to determine all the critical structures operating in Okazaki fragment maturation. That is the uh, gap filling uh, complex formed of by pol, pol delta PCNA and FEN1, the flat cleavage complex, and the uh, end joining complex. So we show that Okazaki fragment maturation is likely to function through two tool belts centered around FEN1. Okay? A gap filling tool belt that promotes the uh, transfer of the um, flap substrate from the polymerase to FEN1, and the end joining tool belt that promotes the transfer of the nicked substrate from FEN1 to the ligase for its ligation. And uh, now I would, would like to uh, thank the people who participated into this project, the team in Leicester, uh, Claudia Carey, Taha, and, and the, the primary facility managers, TJ Ragan and Christos, and of course the uh, group in um, Kaust, led by uh, Samir Hamdan, and in particular Mohammed Texino produced many, all approaches that you've seen in this project, and uh, Vlad, who carried out the biochemical studies, and Eugene, who carried out the single molecule studies. Now, if I have a, just a couple of more minutes, I would like to um, uh, give you a brief overview of what, what we are at Kaos. Kaos is a university in Saudi Arabia, in the, on the shores of the Red Sea about an hour away from Jeddah. And um, that's a place where I moved to about a year ago. Kaust is, a, is a quite a, 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 quite a good place, if I, if I may say, uh, to, to join if you are a student or, or a postdoc because of the uh, very uh, competitive infrastructures and the diverse community in terms of um, programs. Bioscience, bioengineering, plant marine, and science programs. Of course, we have a very generous funding scheme and uh, competitive salaries for both students and postdocs. We have more than 100 nationalities on campus, and we are in a very beautiful country that is ready to be explored, and it, it, which is now open to tourists too. That's how we spent the, uh, our last Christmas, uh, the cryo Christmas uh, in Kaust uh, at the uh, beach facility. And uh, just thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer.